Well, two years after the World Health Organization first described COVID-19 as a global pandemic, leaders in Canada and many other parts of the world appear ready to move on. The last of the Canadian public health measures are set to lift over the coming weeks. And while mandates and pandemic-related restrictions are being removed, there are a number of unfortunate lasting impacts that can't be simply lifted with a government timeline case in point, the damage to our mental health. It's something we've talked about consistently over the last two years, and today's joint Angus Reid poll has few surprises. Overall, half of Canadians, 54%, say their mental health has worsened over the past two years. One in three, 33%, uh, they say it has not changed greatly either way. Only one in eight, 12%, say they feel better mentally now than when the pandemic began. And women between the ages of 18 and 54 fare the worst. 60% uh, of 18 to, uh, so we look at that there, and then also uh, we have 60% of 18 to 34-year-old women say their mental health has worsened, and then 63% of those ages, 35 to 54, note the same. So it's that 18 to 54 group that is most concerning. Joining us live tonight, once again, the president of Angus Reid Institute, Shachi Curl. Thanks for being here, Shachi. Along with registered psychotherapist Marnie Wedlake from the School of Health Studies at Western University. Thank you both for being here tonight. Uh, Shachi, no real surprises here. I mean, we recognize, we know that people have suffered with their mental health throughout the pandemic, but that 18 to 54 group. Why is that? Is that because young women are in school trying to enter the workforce, raising children, uh, dealing with those challenges, caregiving careers? What did you find? Yes. <laughs> All that. So, yeah. All of those things. And we know, for example, that young people across the gender divide uh, are, are taking the last two years harder than, say, people who are of retirement age. There is a big disparity between how young adults have fared over the last two years than older people. And then you get into the mix and you say, who's the caregiver in the family? Who's the caregiver often in the household? And, you know, who is dealing with the sandwich generation of maybe not only caring for children in the household, but also uh, maybe looking after an elderly parent, aunt, uncle, loved one. There is a burden that is resting uh, disproportionately on the shoulders of women of working age uh, in this country. And also, I think it has to do to an extent um, with the fact that perhaps sometimes women are also more likely to talk about their feelings, mm -hmm. talk about uh, how they're doing and put their hand up and say, actually, yeah, this has been uh, a difficult time for me. Just to put a bit of frame or context around this, Christina, we know, for example, because we have been tracking the mental health and emotional well-being of Canadians over the course of two years now, that we're actually, as a nation, in a slightly better place than we were, say, even last November or last August. But we're still far off where we were at the beginning of this pandemic mm -hmm. two years ago. So those those will be lasting impacts, no doubt. Uh, Marnie, I'm going to come to you. I have one more follow-up here for Shachi. You, you noted exactly what I was thinking. Why don't we see men between 18 to 54 higher up on your list. I mean, good thing we don't. It's better not to see anyone high up on this list. But I imagine it's because perhaps even as a pollster are men less reluctant to share that they're struggling. You know, there can be some generational differences around that. That's why you tend to see younger men more likely to say, yeah, I've been struggling, because we've seen over the years a concerted effort through the kind of media and, and influencers that younger men follow, where there's been some space created for them to talk about their mental health. But also, you know, I saw one finding that really had me go, huh, and that was to do with the fact that we see there's almost no change or in some cases uh, a sense of, of being more supported for, for older men than for any other age or gender demographic. So we asked a question like, have you felt supported? Have you mm -hmm. felt like you had good networks around you? Almost every demographic said no, except for older men who were like, yeah, this has been a much more supportive time for me. So um, it, I, I do think it comes down to, in part, the willingness to talk about it, but I think it also comes down to the fact that it may be that, that through this time, the burden has not been carried proportionately. Mm -hmm. And that has been quite clear. Marnie, we know 
Uh, there has been, and this has been widely reported, even by us, large numbers of women who have left the workforce, uh, what has been known as the, the she session. Uh, we know women in terms of their caregiving, in terms of online learning. Of course, men partake in this as well. Uh, but we have seen throughout the pandemic disproportionately women, women of color impacted. There's no easy answer in terms of how does this group 18 to 54 recover, but, but what are you saying in terms of, are we gonna see a period of years that this recovery will take place? Yeah, you know, so this is such a big topic and I, I think we wanna, uh, you know, pause for a bit and take a little bit of a step back and really uh, resist the temptation to medicalize or pathologize any of this, right? And so, um, you know, we have been sitting with some really big issues for a long time, right? Two years of uncertainty, of wrestling with uh, vulnerability around our own mortality. We don't do well with those on a good day. Certainly two years is a marathon. Um, and so that has had an impact on most people, right? Um, you know, so I think we really want to normalize uh, the big feelings that come as a result of this, this marathon we've all been running and, and that, you know, restriction, social isolation, you know, caregiver burnout, um, you know, women are always disproportionately affected by these sorts of things, right? So we want to normalize that. Um, I think we want to, as I said, resist the temptation to medicalize, but we want to realize that with these big experiences come uh, things like grief, things like despair, things like fear, right? We want to really normalize that as appropriate and expected responses to a very large and catastrophic event. Uh, Marnie, are people getting help? Are you finding that people who have never sought out a therapy as a resource before have moved forward with that throughout the pandemic or are now? Uh, yeah, I got to tell you, I work in a growth industry. Right. And uh, and that's is that a good thing or not? I mean, you know, I think maybe we could look at this as um, perhaps because so many people have had to wrestle with their own big feelings. That some of the uh, challenges, some of the barriers that really are in with with our own minds about, you know, do I really want to go and talk to someone? Because that causes me to feel some sort of sense of vulnerability that I'm not comfortable with. Oh, because this has been so pervasive, I think that it's been somewhat easier for people to say, I really need to talk with someone. Whereas prior to the pandemic, it was kind of like those people who go and find a therapist or who, who have some kind of mental health support, right? So if maybe the silver lining in this is, is that um, it's not just those people anymore who are despairing, who are depressed, who are anxious, who are really struggling. It's most people. And so the challenges that come with uh, um, sort of admitting that uh, emotional burden is big, some of those barriers have been um, uh, have been relaxed for some people. And then let's be honest, I mean, certainly in that, that group of women, that, uh, uh, that uh, 18 to what was 18 to 54, 54 what, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, that, I mean, how much can you ask one person before they just start to buckle and they say, I really need some help. So, you know, inordinate pressure, huge, uh, I just can't do it anymore. The, 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 the camel's back has been broken a long time ago and the barriers have come down because despair and struggle has become normal because so many people are living with it. Yeah, absolutely. I think you made a great point. Before the pandemic, there were people who were likely to seek out help. Maybe that's based on, the, on their personality. And now there are others who have said, yeah, I need it. I want to wrap this up with Sachi. If you could talk about there was a, a physical health aspect to this poll. And a lot of people at the beginning of the pandemic particularly had time on their hands at home, could go for walks, but uh, they couldn't go to the gym. They couldn't engage in the same way. So what would you find? Right. And I'm not obviously a medical, uh, a mental health expert. Uh, my my co-panelist is, but one of the things that I always read about when, when we say, you know, if you're not feeling great emotionally, if you're not feeling great mentally, what are the things you should do? D go to the gym, don't isolate yourself, uh, see friends and family, volunteer, be with others, talk it through. The pandemic has taken away so many of those immediate, um, entry level uh, helps that we would normally seek out to to deal with some of our low mood, our anxiety, our depression, 
are burnout. Uh, and that hasn't been available. And it's it's been a little bit different region to region. This is a national poll. But when you look at, for example, people living in the GTA in Ontario and Quebec, where it's been lockdown after lockdown, school closure after school closure, even curfews, uh, and where winters are really long. Like, yes, we're seeing a time change this weekend. And yes, spring is around the corner. But the winter-like weather is going to be there for a while. Mm -hmm. And we're now into winter number three of the mm -hmm. pandemic. Mm -hmm. And all of that, again, has an impact on and feeds into that sense of well-being. When you, when you can't act on the physical and the social to help the mental, uh, it certainly, I, I wouldn't necessarily it say it causes it, but it definitely correlates with, again, some of the deterioration that we've seen. Okay, Sachi, Marnie, thank you both. To end on a high note, the poll says 81% of people had an opportunity to take stock throughout the pandemic of what was important to them and what matters in their life. So we'll end on that high. Thank you both. Have a great weekend. Thanks. Thanks.